Hey everybody, Better Call Saul season five is here, which means it's time for another round of basement breakdowns. I'm John Tatey. Look, we got a new basement. We got a new screen. We got a giant microphone, all new. One of my colleagues said it looks almost professional in here. So that's new. It's gonna be the same old breakdowns though. We're just gonna dig deep into the key images, the key lines, the key filmmaking choices in Better Call Saul, just one of the most beautifully made, emotionally rich shows on TV right now. Let's get to it. Join me as I have another Basement Breakdown. All right, I got the title sequence up behind me because I want to get right into it by talking about something that I mentioned last year, which is that the title sequence over time, every season, has gotten a little more degraded. You don't really notice. It's almost imperceptible um, as if you were watching it over the seasons. But when we put them all side by side, you can see that every year this title sequence gets a little choppier. The images get a little messier. So this change over time in the title sequence really encapsulates so much of the story of Better Call Saul to evoke the sort of many visions of, of Jimmy uh, piled all on top of each other. Because it's key here to see that the effect is this VHS effect, right? And it's almost as if every year the title sequence gets taped over with itself, right? This is what happens to a tape, a VHS tape, if you've never worked with VHS. I imagine there's a lot of you who haven't. When you tape over it, the image degrades over time. And sometimes it doesn't record over all the way and ghosts of the old images that were on the tape come through. You can still see them even though you've taped over them. And that is really a technological evocation of Jimmy's life. So VHS is this sneaky, important technology in Better Call Saul. We see Jimmy making tapes of himself for TV. It's you, small business owner. We see Gene watching old tapes of himself as Saul. I'm Saul Goodman, and I will do the fighting for you. VHS comes up a lot because it really does embody this quality of Jimmy in that he thinks he can tape over himself. And whenever he tapes over himself, invents this new identity, re-records a story over the old story of Jimmy or Saul or whoever, what happens is ghosts of the old images peek through. He can never really re-record to his satisfaction. And this Gene effort represents the most vigorous re-recording yet, right? He thinks he's totally erased his old life. And then the moment that sets this season into motion is that, no, he, he can't re-record entirely. The old ghosts are still there. That's sort of the grand arc that this Gene flash forward sets up. So let's pick this cold open apart a little bit. I love the choice of song. Welcome to my world. Welcome to my world, because after all the Gene sort of staging this mini escape, he sort of dips his toe into the outside world beyond this insular life he set up for himself. He drives away as if he's going to end the life of Gene, and he finds that nobody's really chasing him. This companion that he thought he had over his shoulder, you know, he's always looking over his shoulder as Gene, this companion that he thought was there, finally he undertakes the effort to draw that companion out. He's got the police scanner on the seat next to him, right? Are the authorities going to come after me? And what happens is nothing. Nobody comes after him. That companion he thought was there isn't there anymore, if they ever were. So, welcome to my world. It creates this sense that Gene now inhabits a universe of one. He has a world all to himself. But, as we soon realize, the irony of the song is that he has to welcome someone into his world. And this guy, Jeff, could not be less welcome. And you can feel him invading Gene's space. Let's look at the composition here of this scene. So look at how they compose this scene. And a lot of times I advise you to defocus your eyes when you're really trying to focus on, on composition. It sounds counterintuitive, but to focus on composition, defocus your eyes. And when you do that, what you see is that Jeff here, look how much he pops in his really dark outfit. He's got these stripes, these black and white stripes. He's about as vivid as you can get in this muted black and white color scheme. When you defocus your eyes, Gene almost disappears, right? And Which is exactly what he wants to do. Gene is just looking to blend into the background, maybe forever. And here's Jeff in his bold white stripes, drawing attention to the scene, encroaching on Gene's space. Look at him bend in, the angle here of the staging. With this encroachment from every angle, we can really feel um, 
Gene's desperation. So when he's on the phone later with the guy who's gonna evacuate him out, we remember the vacuum repair guy, right? From the end of Breaking Bad. This is the guy that basically erased Saul Goodman and created Gene and put him here and Gene says, we gotta do it again. But by the end of the call, I'm gonna fix it myself. He decides he's gonna take care of it himself. And I think that the we can feel the trauma in this episode with Jeff. And because we can feel it so keenly, we can also feel that maybe something has snapped in Gene. And no, he's not going to run away and destroy himself again. I think there's this ominous sense that Gene is going to, I'm, what's he going to do? Is he going to kill Jeff? Is he going to disappear the guy? We don't really know, but there's this feeling that maybe whatever he chooses to undertake, it could be the final death of whatever little vestige of decent Jimmy McGill, of that soul, is left in Gene. <laughs> So that line, I'm gonna take care of it myself, also in a weird way sets up the, what the, the main story of the episode and the Jimmy Saul timeline, where we see Jimmy not taking care of it himself at all. In fact, Jimmy is letting Saul Goodman come in and solve all his problems. And we see this quite beautifully in the gift exchange scene. This is old school beautiful. We saw these two gifts that Kim had bought for Jimmy at the end of last season, and I love that they pay them off here and bring them back because it really uh, brings out the distance between Kim and Jimmy in this moment. Jimmy has decided he's gonna bring Saul Goodman in to, to reshape his whole life. I can see it, he keeps saying. I can see it. Right? He keeps telling Kim, I can see it. When he looks at Saul, he sees glory and success for himself, something that he's never really seen when he looks at himself as Jimmy McGill, as much as he might have tried. It comes down to a question that really fuels a lot of the character development in this episode, which is the characters are asking themselves, how much am I worth? They look at themselves and they're sort of assessing their own value. And Jimmy just feels like he's worth a lot more as Saul than as Jimmy. Of course, Kim disagrees, right? She gives him this briefcase that seems like totally inappropriate now. It's monogrammed JMM. I bought it for Sorry Jimmy. And with a little bit of an edge, um, in Bob Odenkirk's delivery, he says, Yeah, well, Jimmy loves it. <laughs> but he doesn't want to be Jimmy anymore, right? It's this high-status, upstanding, classy briefcase that someone at Schweikert & Cochlear, one of these high-powered Albuquerque law firms, would carry. And that's not who Jimmy's trying to be. That's Kim's picture of Jimmy's path. That's not Jimmy's picture. And then the mug. Oh, I love this mug. We've seen it throughout the series. World's second best lawyer again. It's a cute joke to her, not to him, right? They have always seen this mug very differently. And for him, the mug, consciously or not, has symbolized the fact that he just cannot see himself in uh, having legitimate success in the high status parts of society. I always go back to that crucial shot in the second season of Jimmy trying to jam that mug in the cup holder of his new luxury car that he got with his high powered classy lawyer job and it just won't fit. And it just symbolizes how Jimmy doesn't fit in that world, at least in his own eyes, right? Now he gets this mug again. He's not too happy to receive it. Really look closely at his reaction. Um, he sort of gives it a cursory chuckle, but he immediately says, oh, That's the real mistake. World's second best lawyer, because Saul Goodman is going to give you a run for your money. This mug to him doesn't apply to his world, because now he's number one. You know, there's so much at work in this mug because there's a little bit of Jimmy starting to resent Kim for the way that she makes him feel second best, the way he always felt toward Chuck all his life, right? Now a little bit of that emotion is starting to spill over to Kim. She has this knack for making him feel less than her because frankly, she generally behaves as a better person, right? She generally tries to stay more within the bounds of the law. He's always trying to bring her to his level. Um, because he doesn't like feeling second best to her. It's, I just can't see it. It's okay. You will. So let's go to the tent sequence, and I want to say one more thing about I can see it versus I can't see it. Jimmy, I can see it. I can see Saul, and, and Kim can't. If you've watched the breakdowns before, you know by now how the show uses cool and warm colors, specifically blue and gold, but cool and warm. Blue tends to dominate when the storytelling pertains to the lawful 
decent side of society. And you'll see more gold when we're in the seamier, underside, amoral side of life, life beyond the pale of law and order, right? You see this on the screen constantly, blue and gold. Um, it's a really fundamental part of the show's visual language, and you're gonna hear me talk about color again and again because the show keeps finding beautiful and inventive ways to use this palette. So I said cool and warm, because I wanted to leave a little room for red. The show brings red in when it wants something even deeper than gold, when it wants to show that we are neck deep in this underworld, totally detached from any moral grounding. So when we have this big reveal here of Saul Goodman Next. in his circus tent, it's pretty significant that he's bathed in red. Red suit, red shirt, red striped tent. He's not just skirting the fringes of society here. That would be more gold. He is immersing himself in the fringes, in just the outer reaches of society. And this image of Saul with a big grin, the ringmaster welcoming one sideshow act in, after another into his sort of makeshift circus tent slash law office. How perfect an image is that? Circus tent slash law office. This is how Jimmy sees himself as Saul, right? Compare that to, I wanna jump back a little bit to the first shot we see after the title sequence. We see Kim, it's really blurry, out of focus, right? Kim's coming down the hall, she's pursuing Jimmy. She's really pursuing Saul, though she might not know it yet. And there's this blur of orange and red on the screen. Now to me, this is how Kim sees Saul. It's just indistinct. She doesn't have the vision that Jimmy does. It just looks like a mess and it looks like a whole lot of trouble. Although note, there is that little whisper of blue in there. It looks like there's one guy in a blue shirt and that's perfect because even now Kim feels that there's some part of Jimmy slash Saul that can be rescued. That whisper of blue is the decency, the potential for upstanding success that Kim sees in Jimmy that she still sees in Saul. These are two very important shots that I think define the very different points of view that our characters have on Jimmy. So Jimmy's vision of Saul is, is sharp, it's vivid, it's exciting, and most important of all, it's number one. Say hello to my little friend. Because what's the line we hear over and over in this montage in the tent? Number one on the speed dial goes directly to me. You press that and poof. I'm there. Press number one and poof, Saul Goodman is there. Which is really the story that Jimmy decided to tell himself here. He wants to be number one, okay, poof, there it is. But contrast that to the end of this sequence. Now Jimmy's not repeating number one, he's desperate. He's run out of free cell phones to give away. He so desperately needs to feel some sensation of success, of momentum with Saul that he resorts to that 50% off deal that he had discussed with Kim and even he had admitted, maybe half-heartedly, but he had admitted, wow, that is really low. Nonviolent felonies, a 50% off. Yeah. I like that it's nonviolent, so he uh, saves that shred of decency. But 50% off, contrast that to number one. Look how quickly Saul goes from, I'm number one to, I'll, I'll give you half off. That's sort of his magic trick here, right? That's the irony in Hewell calling him the magic man and he call him calling himself the magic man. And his idea, the magic is, poof, I'm Saul, I've appeared. But really the magic trick he's, he's playing is that he's making himself disappear. 50% off, he devalues himself 50% in an instant. 50% off. Remember, 50% off. Right. As soon as he gets a whiff of failure, he debases himself before the scum of society, no less. This is how badly he needs that Saul Goodman story to succeed. Well done, magic man. It's a painful scene and the gloom really plays out so poignantly in contrast to that Next. first shot of grinning, glowing Saul. So this public act of devaluation we see from Saul sets up the last scene with Kim at the courthouse. Okay, first, let's look at Saul on this scene. He's not in red here. Look, he's clad in blue and gold. This is significant because fittingly here, we see Saul playing both sides of the line. Legal, illegal, illegitimate, legitimate. And that is really Saul Goodman at his most powerful, right? He's playing off his old sparring partner in the DA office, the guy on the blue team, but it's really all for the benefit of the sort of shadier characters hanging out in the halls, the people on the gold team, the underworld team. So. He really feels like he's at the top of his game when he encounters Kim because he's working both sides of the line perfectly. 
he comes up with a lie that Kim can tell her client to basically trick him into accepting a deal, a deal that would be for his own benefit, okay? And this is sort of Kim's escape hatch because the question is, why does she say no, 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 no? And then she goes back and tells the lie. Well, I think she gets back and she looks at this picture of this doe-eyed, couldn't be more innocent young mom and this kid, um, her boyfriend, who really doesn't know how to make good life decisions. And what happens basically is the lie is too good. She can get what she wants. She can get what she wants for the good of this kid if she simply tells the lie. This visual contrast that we see in the wake of this exchange with the client and when she does get him to accept the deal, she dupes him into it. There's a visual contrast that really punctuates the effect of this decision on Kim. As she walks away, the shot really is warm, warm to neutral, right? And it's a great performance, subtle performance by Ray Seahorn here. We can see her holding back the internal recriminations. She's holding her head up almost as if she's made the right decision despite how bad it felt. But then we cut to the stairwell and it has this harsh, deep, cold blue cast. Kim will always come back to this place. I don't mean literally this place, although she has been here before. What I mean is she comes back to this stark blue realm of law and order, and that is where she assesses herself. And right now, when she looks at Kim Wexler in this light, she sees less of herself. She bends down, shrinking under the emotional weight of this loss that she feels. Look at the labor it takes for her to just stand up and feel like a human being again. You know, when last season ended, we saw Kim experiencing the pain of feeling like she had just been duped by Jimmy. And you can go back and check out my breakdown for that episode called Winner um, if you want to hear more about that. But the moment that ends this episode has such a different feel because Kim wasn't duped here. She made a calculated choice. She knew what she was doing and she chose to basically sacrifice a little bit of herself, let a little bit of herself die to help the people in her care, in her stead. Jimmy's story was simply too good to resist in terms of the, of the goal that was right in front of her, a kind-hearted, sensible goal that she had. The problem for Kim is that Jimmy's always gonna have another story, right? He's always gonna provide her another opportunity to sell a little piece of herself to help someone else. It's this toxic interaction between his storytelling talents and her compassion her deep-set compassion, right? Whenever these two things mix, some piece of Kim ends up being destroyed. We've seen it again and again, and at some point, Kim's gonna have to choose between the blue and gold worlds, right? Which in essence means choosing between Jimmy and her vision of herself. The longer she keeps trying to have it both ways, to use the blue and the gold together, for the greater good, the more she's gonna keep wasting away. So that's where we are with Kim and Jimmy as we begin this season of Better Call Saul. That'll do it for this installment of Basement Breakdown. But wait, you might be saying, what about Mike? What about Lalo? We've got to talk about Lalo, don't we? I love Lalo. So what we're gonna do, I'm gonna have a whole add-on, a sort of bonus Basement Breakdown for the season premiere. We're gonna cover the Lalo storyline. I got a lot to say about Lalo. It's gonna be Lalo Palooza here on The Basement Breakdown. Um, so stay tuned for that. We'll get to all of it. Wanted to focus on Kimmy and Jim. <laughs> Wanted to focus on Kim and Jimmy <laughs> this week. I'm gonna do that a lot on The Basement Breakdown this season, uh, so get used to it. Before I go, here's a reminder. I don't see everything in the show, and maybe you disagree with what I did see. Great, I wanna know what you saw. That's the great thing about Better Call Saul. It's such a rich show, it gives us so much to talk about. Um, so tell me down in the comments what you saw. You can also email me, breakdowns at ological.net. Maybe your brilliant insights will make it onto a future breakdown. Remember to subscribe and I'll be back real soon. See you there, bye for now.